I know I'm pretty early to have to do things on my own. And I don't like to show my feelings like this in public, you know? There was loss in her life. Marguerite gave up her country and became a refugee. The Nazis came into power and I was grown up. I had to leave from one day to the other. So she was a woman who experienced enormous tragedy and pain. A very unique, profoundly talented woman. I was so fascinated by the Bauhaus. I thought, when it starts, I'll be there. And I was the first potter at the Bauhaus. Well-known potters in America saw her throw, and they were just dumbfounded. That just shook up the world of ceramics. People had never, ever seen somebody with those skills before, especially not a woman. You can't teach what you haven't got. So one thing one has to be somebody before you can teach somebody else also to be somebody. You think of Pond Farm and you think of it as a pottery, if it was a pottery. It was a school, but what it really was was a work of art. People come up here and always say, how did you find a place like that? I say, find? What doesn't find the place? What makes a place? I believe this recorder is working now. Today is March 14th, 1981, and I am with Marguerite Wildenhain at her home at Pond Farm. I used to go on big hikes every Sunday when we had the day off. And at the time, I was working for the Poston factory. And on one of those Sunday hikes, I went to Weimar, where when I saw this big announcement, there was the Bauhaus proclamation nailed on the wall, and I stood like hypnotized in front of it. I nearly swooned, you know, I was so excited. The Bauhaus was not a school in that way. We were craftsmen. This was the idea of Gropius. We had to go back to the crafts, not art school. At the Bauhaus, every worship had two masters. There was the art master and the craft master. You had to be accepted by both. Freyhan, my master, his father and grandfather and great-grandfather all been potters. The workshop which I learned was Mark 1770, and we learned like he would have taught an apprentice of his, right from scratch from the beginning. We came every morning at seven o'clock and we worked an eight and a half hour day. We had to make 100 of this sort and 100 of this sort and 500 maybe of this sort. And he would go around and say, well, we'll keep that one and that one. Otherwise, you can throw away. I had been seven years a potter, three years an apprentice, four years a German. That was a prerequisite. After that, you could apply to become a master. And at that time, I was the first woman who ever became a potter. They just couldn't believe it. The master who had given me the degree, he said, too bad my boy married that girl six months ago. He shouldn't have married another one than her. That was the highest praise he could say on me. <laughs> I got to kick out of that. At the Bauhaus, for instance, we had no degrees, no diploma, nothing. 
And when the American professors came to visit Gropius and they say, what did the student get when he's through with his uh, work? He say nothing. He's either learned something or he hasn't. Well, don't they need a diploma? No, Gropius said. If what we taught was right and they do a good job, they won't need a diploma. And if they do a bad job, they don't need a diploma either. They should not have a diploma. And this was the philosophy of the Boers. But the main thing, I would say quickly, was that it was built on the calves and a complete human being. And if it were good, the craftsman would become an artist. That's how I feel, too. That was just when the Nazis were coming into power. And you know, I'm Jewish. The Burmese of the city in Halle was very fond of me and talked highly of me. He came personally to my studio and the river was in tears. He thought I had to leave because the Nazis otherwise would destroy the whole school. That's how it was. So I left the next day, just like that. Jane and Gordon Hare visited us when we lived in Holland and asked us if we would come if they started a school for the crafts in the United States. <laughs> and we had sort of said, oh, sure, we'd be glad to go to America, you know, like one would say. So the, there we were seven years till the Nazis again marched in Holland and I fled again. We sailed very slowly through the channel full of mines. We went without the motors. They just let themselves drift, figuring out that if they'd hit a mine, they would probably be in the same sort of movement rather than if they went like this straight, you know? Now, when we arrived in New York, and I thought the Statue of Liberty was disappointingly small. That was my first impression. My father's dream for Pond Farm was to create a space in a rural area for artists to work and teach at the same time. My parents approached Marguerite and suggested if she could get out and come, they could work together. And so when there was an opportunity to get out safely with a concept of where to go, she was the first to go. On farm it was a concept that was in harmony with the Bauhaus. It was something exciting to help build as a concept, and it attracted incredible artists. All of the artists that came were Jewish, including Marguerite. Victor Reese was also there in the barn, and he's taught metalwork. Trude Gilmopre did her weaving classes. And so you're talking about almost two years of this incredible experiment. We all had this idea of the Bauhaus to do the same thing in a way as we had done in Europe, based on crafts.
these people were highly intellectual, well-read, well-trained, people who have suffered unbelievable tragedies, lost members of their family, and they had been at the height of intellectual, artistic challenges in, in Europe and in Berlin and all of that. And then they come out in the wilderness. I don't know who in this country would have wanted to live in such a primitive way and start from scratch, except people who were escaping Europe. On one hand, it was like a small, intense, special community who found each other. On the other side, it was full of drama. Many years later, everyone except Marguerite had had enough and so they left, and Marguerite stayed. For my feeling, the art should never be in college. It should be in art schools where it was based on crafts, on being all day in a shop. Like, it always has been all over the world. An apprentice in uh, weaving or something in Italy or in China, he is with the master all day and every day, not two hours at a time. Sure. It takes half an hour to get the thing ready. It takes another half hour to clean up. You have about an hour to work every second day or third day. Well, nobody can be good that way. It's impossible. A lot of people wanted to study with Marguerite. It wasn't easy. I mean, she would get uh, dozens and dozens of applications that she wouldn't take. And so she's, okay, I'll take you. But this is not a vacation. This is not fun. This is hard work. I said, oh, no, I know, I know. But, of course, I had absolutely no idea. You were throwing six hours a day, five days a week. You were working as hard as you could, doing as well as you could, or leave. Because I was a rank beginner, I was sort of frightened of her because she was such a force. The thing is, she started us all out at the same place. There was a prescribed number of forms that you learned to make. From those forms, simple as some of them were, you could make anything. Each step was the basis for the next one and make it so you could line up a dozen of them that were all the same. The point is to learn it so well that you don't have to think about it. She was teaching the technique of how to make these shapes, but also behind it, which I didn't grasp for a long time, she was teaching us to see visually. You would have a, 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 a plank of pots there, and in the beginning, she would say, well, that one's pretty good, and that one's pretty good. And in the beginning, you can't see. I couldn't tell the difference. Gradually, you start to see, oh, this one has more form than that one has. Here, you have all the same little flower pots sitting there, but she's that, you say, well, why is that third one good? What is it about it? So then you start looking with great more attention. I can see the size-shape relationship, the size of the base to the size of the rim to the height of the piece. That's not that different than the others, but it is enough different that it just looks more formful. One of her favorite expressions was, a millimeter makes a difference. I mean, that's how keen you needed to learn to see. The classes were nine weeks long. The last three weeks, she wanted you to do something to see what you could do with that information. Well, that can go almost anywhere. It depended on how artistic you were. She gave you the method of becoming an artist, but you, it was up to you to do the art end of it. Let me quote from Lao Tse. Pots are made out of clay, 
but the hollow in them is the essence of a pot. I've stood in Iran and I've cried in front of a big pot handmade in Susa, 3000 BC. Why? Because it moved me so it was so beautiful, just with black and red clay. And this is the point that also my students get. It's not the technique. I admire if you have something to say with that technique, you know? The prehistoric people had no technique to speak of, but they can make pots that move you. As a student, we rode our bicycles here every day. Getting to this corner, finally coming out of the, the redwoods and seeing the rocky prominence here, it was just like, oh, we made it, and hot and sweaty. <laughs> but often on a foggy morning like this in the summer, This barn is where it all happened. They, they had four stalls in here, uh, nine stalls there, and there were at least four or five in the, in the sidecar room, too. You got two wheels here, one on top and one on the bottom. The bottom one you kick, the top one you use your hands to manipulate the clay into a form that you're interested in. There's something that is put into the clay by kicking the wheel. There's breathing that occurs while you're doing it. And you can see that in a pot. Uh, you can see it in Marguerite's pots because her pots were all made on the kick wheel. That's disappeared some in the pots that contemporary potters make because they're working on electric machines. People always ask me, aren't you lonesome or girl by yourself? Or aren't you bored, they always say. I said, no, I'm only bored when they invite me to a boring cocktail party. Then I'm bored. <laughs> but they come with a stunning, you see? But when I'm alone, I have all this beautiful nature. Why should I be bored? When I planted this garden, it was just open and dry like it is outside there. It was sort of elating to be a lot of nothing, something. Well, it all looks nice now, but how much sweat and muscles I put in, nobody sees that. I think all artists need isolation at a certain term. Some need more uh, people than others. Some feel at home when there are no people around. That's a matter of character. There was this awe of this woman who had managed to carve this life for herself, which scared me. And on the other hand, it was just a marvelous experience of what someone can do if they're willing to, in some ways, give up a lot of other things. 
When students came in the summers to see Marguerite, we saw how alone she was. She was nine months out of the year, 10 months out of the year, lived alone. It's kind of a staggering model to see, but it's also very understandable. A lot of artists are kind of recluses. Thoreau says, you're wealthy by the number of things you can leave alone. You live frugally, honestly. You don't have to go to a fancy restaurant. You don't have to drive a fancy car. You don't have to have all of this stuff. You have it in your everyday life. Marguerite lived by those ideas, and she gave me the courage and knowledge to also live by those ideas. To be a captain is also a way of life. It's not only that you have a job. That is what we did learn at the Bauhaus. But the craft was only the beginning. It's not only that we learned pottery. We learned something about life and how to live. You can smell the burned out smell today from the fire last summer, it just practically destroyed Pond Farm. It was so close. These big eucalyptus trees now down. Marguerite talked about the patterns in nature and death, decay, renewal. She has wonderful drawings of a leaf in all stages of life and decay when it's just down to a few webs of the veins. She tried to wake us up to finding inspiration in this minutia. Marguerite asked me, where do you think ideas come from? You think they just come through the ethers? You have to draw, you have to look, and then from those drawings, then you get ideas. You want to draw rotting woods and live woods and seed pods and feathers, and all these things will give you ideas to how to make new forms. Most of us hadn't done anything like that in our lives. I told one student to go out and pick something to draw. I said, I didn't find anything. I said, what do you mean? All this come right there, and you didn't find? I said, all right, let's take a piece of grass, 10 inch square. What do you see? Nothing. I said, what do you mean, nothing? I said, what's that? That's a piece of grass. And I said, what's that? That's a piece of grass. Is that the same? After a while, the whole class stands on this one square piece and is watching how many different pieces of grass they can find. Like this, I open the eyes. I feel in the schools, they're only teaching me techniques or, or simple skills, where up here, although I'm learning a lot of techniques and skills, I feel that I'm developing as a human being. Yeah, I think and, that's and great. And that's directly because of you as a person. Yeah, that looks really good, I think. Don't you? Marguerite was teaching pottery, but she wasn't really teaching pottery. She was using pottery to teach you how to live. She didn't expect all of her students to be potters. I mean, she said, my God, we'd have so many potters, we wouldn't know what to do with them. She wanted you to become an, an artful person, a person who lived with art. She taught the rest of us the skills that she was taught in order that we might be able to live that life as well. She was living her ideals. She was not just talking the talk, she was walking the walk, and it committed her whole life to it, and committed her life to her students. We were profoundly important to her. She loved us and worried about us. Because something happens to all of us in the interchange of learning and living, uh, we all like each other. We do uh, become a family, the pond farmers. I could travel to the whole United States every 200 miles about there was a student of mine where I could stay overnight from San Diego and Vancouver and clear to Nova Scotia, everywhere. They always say, you've done so much for me, I can never repay it. This is my great joy. I don't think there are many people who have so much love and gratitude from people as I get. It's sometimes so strong that it chokes me. I, I can't take it, you know? 
I mean, I could die today, and I, I don't think I've missed anything. There's something about taking a lump of clay and taking it in your hand. The first reaction is, is completely primitive. I can squeeze it like this, I can squeeze it like that. Every child will do, at all times, and in every country. And this is what is the fascination of pottery. And if I have any talent, it could be a beautiful pottery.